You know what fills your bucket? What drains your bucket? Aren't those great, powerful questions? I mean, aren't those questions that apply to every single one of us, regardless of what season we're in in life, whether you're whether you own a business or not, whether you aspire to, whether you're in management at work or not, at the job you have, whether you have a job or not, whether you spend every day during the week in a suit or you spend every day of the week in yoga pants, it doesn't matter. Those are questions that apply to every single one of us. And that's just eight minutes of about a 30-minute lecture from this pastor who many of you have probably never heard of before. Sometimes we see a conference, we see an event, we see the names on it, like I don't really know those people, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, I want to encourage you strongly. You may not know the names, just like you may not have known Pastor Wayne's name, uh, and yet it's incredibly relevant content that God can speak through. Um, So today is the last day to register at the discounted rate of $69. I want you to know that for the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, I would challenge you. You would say, I can't do two days. Uh, $69 is more than worth it for just one day. If you can only make Thursday or Friday, sign up, register to go. It is an investment in yourself, in your family, in your relationships, in your profession, in your future, in the dreams that you have for the future, and it's just an incredible time together. We just have a lot of fun too. So you can sign up today at the Connect Corner with cash or a check. Uh, You can also sign up out there. They have a a laptop computer where you can sign up online today using a debit or credit card. They can walk you through that or take that insert in your worship guide and register yourself. I would even encourage you to take out your phone right now so you don't forget about it later and you can go onto the website. You can register right now during the service. It's that important to me for you to be there. Now, last week, one of our summer interns, Matt, delivered a challenging message and the message was really birthed out of just one verse that had really impacted his life in James chapter 1. And he talked about James. James was Jesus' little brother. I mean, imagine that kind, of, that kind of role model, that kind of comparison all the time. And so he was aware and around Jesus throughout his entire childhood. And then later on as an adult, he would choose to become a disciple of Jesus. Now, James was not one of the original 12 disciples. In fact, when Jesus' ministry was going on, James was a little bit speculative about the claims being made, not only by Jesus, but by those around Jesus. But it would be later on when Jesus would rise from the grave and appear to James where James could not deny what he had seen and what he had experienced. And so uh, James's testimony is one of significance because he saw everything, everything public, everything private. And and he captures for us incredible lessons about life in the book that he contributes to the pages of the Bible. Uh, James chapter 1, and last week, Matt kind of launched off of verse 22, which is where I want to kind of begin today. He said this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. This is, there are direct correlations all throughout the Bible between listening or watching or taking in content and then turning it into actions of obedience, taking in and giving out. You can kind of see the same parallel there with what Wayne was talking about, filling and draining, taking in and giving out. We learn through listening, we learn through watching, we learn through discussing, we grow through praying together, meeting together, worshiping together. But then the challenge is to leave this place and actually put into practice or do what it is we've learned, what it is we've heard, what it is we've discussed, what it is we've been thinking about. The life of a disciple was not meant to be lived in a perpetual state of spiritual constipation. I mean, you know what constipation is in a physical sense. Did you know it was possible spiritually as well, where we just constantly take in more and more and more and more, and we chew on more and more and more about faith content, and yet sometimes go through seasons where we rarely take steps of practicing or sharing or releasing much of that that we've gathered over time. Last week, as Matt closed out the message, he challenged us in our minds to consider a person that we knew that we could serve in a practical way. Someone we could serve, not just so we would feel good, not because we're supposed to, but to serve in response to the fact that Jesus served us and laid down his life for us, giving his life on the cross. I want to encourage you, if you missed the message, you can go online and catch up and check it out. Today, I want to kind of carry on that theme. Don't just listen or deceive yourself into thinking that that taking it in is good enough and then go about your life and do what you want to do. No. But do what God is laying or impressing upon your heart based on the the inspiration of his word to actually be obedient to. And and I want to look at this today in a very practical way. I want to look at it in a wise way from the perspective of of long-term goals that all of us need to set in order to experience those dreams for the future. Yeah. 
We had a little bit of a glitch of this last week in the evening service too. So I want to look at this practically. Looking at long-term goals that we set where our desires actually change based on God's influence in our lives. Do you have dreams for the future? Do you have like visions of what you'd like to experience, what your life, what you'd like your life to be like, what you'd like your kids or grandkids' lives to be like? I mean, what are your wildest dreams? What are God's wildest dreams for you? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever sought that out? Have you discovered where God's dreams for your life and your dreams for your life kind of intersect? Have you experienced where your dreams for your life and God's dreams for your life are not quite the same dreams, and so you've submitted your dreams and accepted God's dreams, believing that they're actually bigger and better than your own? You may not believe that yet or see that yet, but you do fundamentally believe that that's the case. You know, it's been said that there are three kinds of people in the world. There's those that make things happen, there's those that watch things happen, and then there's those that don't know what's happening. And I would say all of us probably would like to be in that first group. We want to make things happen. We want to be initiators of our lives. But we don't want things just to, we don't want to just watch things happen to us. We don't want to just passively take it in. We don't want to be completely absent of what's going on in our lives and have no idea what's coming or what we're doing. But we want to actively pursue things. We want to be catalysts to the things that are happening in our lives. And in order for that to occur, we have to have a vision or a dream of where it is we're moving, what it is we're chasing. And we have to set up goals that we're going to set to reach those things, to experience them, for them to become a reality, which means we actually need to do what we know we need to do. Not just listen, not deceive ourselves into thinking taking in is enough, but actually do it. Now, God warns of us of this in the Old Testament through the words of Solomon in a very simple way. In Proverbs 29, a very familiar verse of Scripture, verse 18, where Solomon says, Where there is no vision the people perish. I mean, without an idea of where we're going, without a picture or an image of where it is that we're moving or what we want to accomplish, it's really hopeless to ever realize the things that we want to experience in life. I mean, you see this all the way throughout the Old Testament. God gave visions and dreams and ideas, and he planted them in the minds of individuals who didn't feel capable of accomplishing it, but then God helped them step by step by step begin to influence others to head in that direction. Do you have a dream? Do you have a vision? Chances are you do. That's not normally the thing we struggle with. But the step that most of us neglect, it's not the dream for the future. Most of us carry images of things we'd like to experience in the future. You know, places we'd like to go or careers we'd like to have or business ideas we'd love to start, ventures we'd like to take the risk of, relationships or seasons in life we'd love, we can't wait to experience. We hold those images or ideas in our minds of this preferred future But oftentimes, we neglect to create a set of goals step by step that are actually going to make those dreams become a reality. I mean, yeah, you got to have ambition, but you also need a target to shoot for. And nothing of significance will happen if we don't set goals that are going to help us get there. And nothing of significance will happen if we don't set God-honoring goals where we ask God to do what only He can do in those areas. Now, as a church and as the pastor here at Fusion, These are thoughts that have been continuing to run through my mind and my heart and my spirit on a consistent basis over the last year, knowing that we believe as a congregation that God is setting us on a course with a vision or dream of multiplication, of seeing this one location that's called Fusion Community Church multiply into two, creating another access point within our communities, within our region of the world, where where it's a little closer, for, for where it expands the region or grasp or reach of ministry, We have and plants another congregation in another community on a consistent basis where people can be actively engaged in a part of who we are. And we know for this to ever become a reality, we have to figure out specific goals or marks along the way we need to reach and move towards so that one day that dream of multiplication can become a reality. And it's not just one becoming two, but one becoming two and two becoming three and three becoming four. Whether that's planting autonomous churches, sending a group of people far from here, whether that's planting a church internationally, whether that's creating another campus or multi-site model, we can never reach that destination without steps that we're taking intentionally to get there. It just won't magically happen. In the same way that in your personal life and my personal life, things don't magically happen accidentally just improve and get better and become and thrive. 
It takes intentional pursuit. It takes sacrifice. It takes discipline. And it takes goal setting. Discerning God's next steps for us. Where our dreams and his dreams are intersecting. Where we're even yielding our dreams to his dream. And this applies in our collective church, and it applies in our personal lives as well, and it applies in our role, if you're a parent, in the way in which you pour yourself into your kids to to help them see that ambition and goal setting and direction is needed. In the Old Testament of the Bible, there's a man named Job, and uh, his would be kind of the case study that that, that we prayed over, the case study for what our, our worship set was about this morning. Job experienced a perfect storm of heartbreaking circumstances all at the same time in life. It was a moment where many of us would agree, if that happened to me, I wouldn't have much hope afterwards. I may not have any hope to carry on or move forward or that anything can improve or get better after that happened. I mean, he lost all of his wealth, which you may say, well, that's bad. Lost his home and, and, and real estate and then lost all of his kids died in one fell swoop. Now, that would be a blow. Most of us couldn't even imagine the death of all his children. And, and, and after what Job experienced in chapter 6, verse 11, this is what he says after he lost so much. He, he identified a strength that he doesn't have. He says, I do not have the strength to endure. I do not have a goal that encourages me to carry on. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom packed into that statement, especially in the wake of severe losses in life. You could even look at the parallel between Wayne, what, what Wayne was talking about. When we feel depleted and drained, if we don't have something to look forward to, something to anticipate, something to plan for that fills our bucket, we all of a sudden begin to look and say, why am I doing this at all? I mean, what's the point? What's the point of the busyness? What's the point of the hectic schedule? What's the point of all the drain in my life if there's not something filling the bucket? Job says, I don't have a goal that encourages me to carry on, especially in the wake of the hardest seasons of our lives is when we lose people that we love. In our congregation over the last year, a couple years, there's been a lot of people that have, have went through this loss in a significant way that are still grieving. Some of you are here. Some of you have lost a loved one, a precious one in the last year. Others of you, it may not be quite to that depth, but you've lost a job you thought was going to be there. And it just kind of wrecked you because your hopes and your dreams are kind of tied to this situation. Or maybe over the last year you went bankrupt. You had to file in a way in which you never thought you would. Or maybe you had an illness or something happened physically, and now you've lost something that you always had. And maybe you would even say, I just kind of took for granted, and now I wish, I wish I could get it back. I mean, life is full of tragedies and accidents. And we can so easily get bogged down by the stuff of life that if we don't have goals that we're chasing, it won't help us climb out of that muck. And God-honoring goals keep us moving forward in the right direction, not the wrong direction. You know, there are goals that are helpful to life, and then there's goals that are hurtful to life. And the ones that bring hope to endure are the ones that are God-honoring. So if you don't have goals in your life right now, and you've recently lost something, a severe loss in your life, I'll tell you without even knowing the details, probably day to day, week to week, you just kind of feel like you're drifting. And you just kind of feel that, like, like what's the point? What am I doing this for? I mean, and goals don't have to be big to help you. If you've ever had surgery, you know this. If you've ever been in a hospital, you've went through a process, and now all of a sudden you're laying there in a bed, you know that every day on that little dry erase board, the nurses are writing up goals for the day. You know, and, and the first one typically is just like sit up in bed. Like it's that simple. It's that small. But it's worthy of celebration when you've went through, when your body's went through a trauma, right? Sit up in bed. Then feed yourself. So someone else doesn't have to feed you. You don't have to be fed through a hose, you know. Uh, and then kind of sit up on the edge of the bed, you know. And then stand up with assistance. Then stand up on your own. Then make your way to the bathroom. And then the one big celebratory thing that like all the nurses, woohoo! they went to the bathroom by themselves. You know, that's like a big day. Then they want you up walking around the floor, right? So you can moon all your neighbors with those awful robes that they have you wear when you're there. I mean, there's these small, measurable goals. And yet they're there because they inspire hope. The point is, everyone is measurable. It's simple, but it's pivotal to regaining health. You know, when they studied the individual survivors of the Holocaust... And all the atrocities committed to them and everything they endured in prison camps, they found common denominators among those who kept the will to live. And oftentimes one of the most common things was they had an aspiration, a dream of something left unfinished that they wanted to live, to experience or to see. A grandchild they never met, a concert they never performed, 
a place they never saw, a project at home that they started but were unable to complete, simple little stuff that gave them drive to not give up, that gave them hope. And this is all because God honoring dreams bring us hope. They bring us hope. That's what Job says. He's like, I have nothing to, I have no goals to chase that gives me hope. And hope is undeniably linked to faith. In the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, we find one of the most often quoted verses about faith in the entire Bible. In the very first verse of Hebrews chapter 11, and this is known as the kind of the, the, the chapter of faith heroes as it begins to list all these individuals throughout history that were faithful to God. And it starts with this big idea. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is that, that, that thing we cling to for dear life, the substance of what we hope for in what we've not yet experienced or seen. And God-honoring goals, they bring hope. In accordance with Hebrews 11, God-honoring goals are God-influenced goals. When we want to honor God with the goals we're setting to chase the dream that he's planted within us, we want to honor God with the goals. But when we chase God-honoring goals, when we set God-honoring goals, we're actually asking God to influence those goals, to lay out the next steps for us. And we're admitting humbly, Lord, we can't figure this out on our own. We're not that good. We need your help. And I think that's where it takes us to the next level in Hebrews 11, in that God-honoring goals stretch our faith. In fact, I would go as far as saying, if you don't have any goals in your life right now, you're not living by faith. You're just coasting. You're just drifting. You're not taking risks. The essence of faith is risk, and godly goals stretch our faith. God calls us to take steps. Steps that don't make sense, steps that we don't feel comfortable with, steps that we don't even know how they're going to turn out. The very fact that we set goals and chase them are statements of faith that they'll be reached. A goal says, I believe God wants me to do such and such by such and such time. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, a goal is actually a demonstration of your life as a disciple. It's a statement of your faith in God. You're saying, not only do I have goals for my own life, but God has called me to something, and he's, he's directed my path in, in, a, in a way in which he's laid out next steps, and if, if I don't take these, now I'm being disobedient to him. Other places in James, in James chapter 4, it talks about if we, don't, if we don't do what we know God's calling us to do, that it's sin, that if we're not obedient, then we're actively participating in sinning against God. I'm trusting God. Goals say I'm trusting God to help me accomplish such and such in my finances or in my family or in my relationships, my career, with my kids, with my dreams, with my future, with my present, in, the, in my friendships, with my boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever category it is. Goals state that I am trusting God to help me in this area. You know, Jesus says something about faith to a couple of uh, blind guys in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, he's, he's there and these guys come to him and and he basically asked them a simple question. Do you believe, do you believe that I can heal you? Do you believe I can correct this infirmity that you've had your entire life? Do you believe it? And they say, yes, Lord. And that's significant. They called him Lord. Yes, Lord, we do. And Jesus touches their eyes and he says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. According to your faith. God basically says, all right, you get to choose how much I bless your life. According to your faith, it will be done to you. If you don't believe, it won't happen. If you're not obedient, it won't happen. But according to your faith, you want God to bless your life a little, trust him a little. You want God to bless your life a little more, trust him a little more. You, God want, to, you want God to open up the floodgates of heaven on you, then trust him with everything. Surrender, submit. And I believe you've never really trusted God until you've attempted to do something or accomplish something or chase something that you are not capable of doing in your own power or your own abilities. I mean, that's where faith comes in. Faith works in the realm of the impossible. So God-honoring goals, their goals leading us towards a vision God has planted inside of us. God-honoring goals require His power alone in order for them to be reached. We can't reach them under our power. For us at Fusion, the idea of planting a new church or launching a second Fusion location, it boggles my mind. It blows me away. I don't know how to get there. I don't know where we need to go. I don't even know what's next. We're just kind of stumbling through and saying, okay, we, we think this is where God is saying the next step we need to take, and, and we're going to take it in faith. We're believing that God wants to create another open door in our community for hurting people to be connected and regular and active part of it. 
we know on a regular basis that the distance many people here at Fusion are driving is significant, and it prohibits sometimes constant, regular involvement in the local church and developing of relationships and involvement in community groups and kids and teens involved as well. Now, God has shown his faithfulness in amazing ways over the last five years specifically, but I believe that what he's done is just preparing us for what he wants to do next. It's going to blow our minds even more, but it's going to take steps of faith. It's going to take risk. It's going to take moving in directions that may not even sound smart, (laughs) but they may sound silly. But oftentimes it's where God moves is in the steps of faith. Don't make sense until you get there. The bottom line is faith works in the realm of the impossible. And if your dreams don't need God to make it a reality, they don't honor him. I'll say that again because I think we missed it. If your dreams don't need God in order to be reached, they don't honor him. God honoring goals stretch our faith. God honoring goals bring us hope in the way that Job needed hope in the midst of crisis. And the third thing is they create focus. This is kind of going back to what Wayne identified in the two buckets. Without objectives that we're trying to hit, we just try to do everything and hope some of it sticks. We find ourselves either doing everything or we feel ourselves paralyzed and we don't do, it, we don't do nothing. Or we just do something because that's better than nothing just to keep busy and we don't actually accomplish anything that helps us reach the vision or the dreams that we really want. And so we've got to figure out how do we do this thing. Not just how do we do something. How, not just how do we keep from doing nothing. How do we just keep from doing everything. We have to figure out how to do, what do we need to do that is the best thing, the next step we need to take. We need to know what to say yes to, and we need to know what to say no to, and and we can't figure that out without a goal in mind. As you look around this room, you can kind of see the the cave environment, and you can see how much focus it took, all the meetings, all the planning, all the ideas, all the Google searches, uh, the hours hours that Gary and Sharon spent uh, ironing these plastic pieces together and then melting them slightly with a hair dryer and putting a golf ball at the bottom of every single one so they hang and spray painting each and every... I mean, can you see the focus, the determination, the commitment, the vision, the goals, the step-by-step process? This just doesn't happen. We didn't just come into the office on Tuesday and boom, it looked like this, right? You could see how much focus and planning and preparation goes in in something just as simple as a facility transformation. How much more needs to go in if you want to see your life take a different direction? If you want to experience something in your life that is far beyond what you're capable of? How much discipline, how much focus is it going to take? I want to encourage you, uh, if you have not signed your kids up, if you haven't really thought about VBS this week, you need to. I mean, your kids will be blown away by what happens this week. If they can't come every night, that's okay. But bring them as often as you can. Invite their, them to invite their friends and neighbors. Bring carloads of people here. It's an opportunity to kind of share the gospel with these kids and with these families. And, and one of the things that's neat is with the cave theme that's been launched this year as a part of VBS, uh, kind of representing dark, cold, isolated, deep underground places. You know, we have the waterfall going for a while, and there's often, you know, holes in the walls where water's coming out when you're deep in a cave. We know a lot about that in this area of the world. But our Takuma Island and Treasure Cove teams every year, they have a penny drive. Now, what the penny drive is, is it's a competition between boys and girls. And so it's not a numerical challenge so much as it is a weight challenge. So pennies are the common denominator. So there will be a bank here every night uh, where you, kids can bring in cash or quarters or nickels or dimes and exchange them for pennies. And we do pennies, so that way everybody can participate. Uh, and so we want to encourage you, starting tomorrow night, all five nights this week, and next Sunday, it'll be our last penny drive, there will be a scale up front, boys against girls, and they'll get all passionate and crazy about it this week, blue versus pink, and they'll be arguing and fighting and competing to see who wins the penny drive this week. But there's a purpose behind the penny drive. It's not just for the sake of fun, but it's always got a cause orientation with it. And this year, the focus of the pennies is going to go towards a cause that addresses the dark, cold, isolated, unspoken, underground places in our world where our kids here in Schoharie County and us as a congregation can be active at turning the lights on in situations in other parts of the world, specifically this year in Albania, where human trafficking is a major issue. I want to share with you just a a video about uh, a movement called End It uh, that identifies how significant the issue of slavery is on a global scale. 
uh, human trafficking, whether it's forced slave labor, uh, whether it's indentured, indentured servitude, uh, whether it is uh, sex trafficking of, of children and women primarily. Uh, this video is going to kind of just kind of give you an, an eye-opening idea about how significant of an issue this is. And this is going to be kind of the focus in the same way that a cave applied to Jesus and there was darkness. It was all because God wanted his light to be shown. And so this is going to be the, the, the focus of this special offering this year for Vacation Bible School to make an impact in other parts of the world to people who are struggling and to rescue them from slavery. So check this out. We're in a fight. Some of us know it and choose to ignore it. Some of us don't know what to do. Many of us have never heard. But the fact still remains there's a fight raging around us. Around you, around me, around the world. In factories, in brothels, in mines, on street corners, in homes, hidden in the shadows. But yet, Slavery still exists. 27 million lives stuck, frozen. Yet people should never be sold. There is no room for excuses or I didn't know. People are not things. People are not property. One human being should never be allowed to own another human being. There is no right or wrong here. Only wrong, only injustice. So we fight. We fight for freedom, we fight for justice. We speak for those who are oppressed, with no voice, no light, and no hope. Let's refuse to be quiet anymore. Let's refuse to sit on the ropes. Let's refuse to sit on the sidelines. Let's jump in the fray and stand up for the 27 million. Let's collectively determine to do something that stirs the consciousness of this sleeping nation awake. Going toe to toe with slavery, with indifference. And we need you. We need your voice, and your heart, and your hand. Join us and other freedom fighters from around the world as we shine a light on slavery. Draw a red X on your hand. Tell the world that slavery still exists and you won't stand for it. Will you stand by? Will you stand up? Will you join this fight for freedom? Together we're stronger than any one of us alone. We, this generation, we can end it. This generation, we can free 27 million. But it will take all of us by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the millions to stand in the ring, to get out of here, to fight with this in the air, to be repeated. So throughout this week, we'll be sharing video footage with uh, your kids and, and sharing more on next Sunday about how we can participate in this. You know, what's interesting is we're part of a network of churches, the Wesleyan denomination, that was really born out of a desire for the abolition of slavery. And here it is a couple hundred years later, and the, the battle is still raging even on a global scale now. So it's something significant that we can be a part of. So I want to invite you tomorrow to send your boys and girls with pennies. Let, give them projects around the house where they can earn money. Don't just hand it to them. Use this as an opportunity for them to be actively a part of committing time and energy to invest in a cause like this. Uh, you have no idea how that can shape the life of a young person. Let them take all the recyclables to the store. I don't know. Figure out a creative way to do it. Let them ravage through the cup holders of your cars where there's probably pennies that we vacuum up on a regular basis. And we'll see who comes out on top next Sunday, the boys or the girls. But the goal is really to bring light to darkness. I mean, that's what Jesus did. He even calls us as the church, the light, eradicating darkness, carrying light, being light and salt in the world in which we live. And in order to do that effectively, we have to set those goals. What's the next step we're going to take? Are we going to, are we going to allow goals to create focus in what we will do and what we won't do in order to accomplish that? Our God set us free through Christ. He gave us freedom from slavery to sin, and this season of, of our church, we're going to get to partner with missionaries in our network within the Wesleyan Church that are active in the country of Albania, near Greece, 
which has historic significance to the time of the Bible being written and, and the early church. But in Albania, to go into that place and to rescue people, men, women, especially children, uh, from, from slavery, from being trafficked. Well, there's no shortcut to focus required to reach the goals of which we have. And the Apostle Paul shares this, and kind of using that same video as an illustration. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets first prize. So run your race to win. Typically, you don't enter a race just to lose. You want to win or you want to beat your last time. You want to compete against yourself, compete against your body, compete against someone else. He says, to win the contest, you have to deny yourselves many things you would keep that would keep you from doing your best. There's a lot of things we could do, and Paul's saying there's only some things, the best things that you must do if you want to excel. As an athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup, but we do it for a heavenly reward ward that never disappears. He goes on, so I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. Other translations saying, with not looking left or right. I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I love this translation, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to. Paul's saying that if you have a dream, if you have a vision, something you want to experience, you can't do everything, and you can't just do something. You have to do the best thing. There's only a few things to do, and the secret is focus. I love how he draws this picture. I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to do. And this is countercultural, isn't it? Because we live in a world, a culture that presents an idea that, you know what, do what you want to do. What you feel like doing today, do it. Don't let anybody tell you you're wrong. Don't let anybody criticize or judge you. Whatever you feel like doing, do it. Whatever you want to say, just let it kind of pop out of your mouth. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to post on your Facebook, post on your social media. And yet God presents us with a countercultural challenge. He says, no, it's not about doing what you want to do. It's doing what you should. Because normally doing what we want doesn't help us realize our dreams. Doing what we want actually sabotages our dreams. And I found one of the biggest lessons that I'm still working my way through learning is the difference between what's urgent and what's important. And oftentimes, they don't present themselves this easily. Well, turn left to urgent or turn right to important. Do I want the payoff now or do I want the payoff that's delayed? Normally, we get so busy, so busy in the gamut of life that we don't stop and think. You know, the things that are urgent are the things you do right now. They need to accomplish today. But the urgent things to do are almost never the most important things to do that day. Yet even though they're not the most important, it's the urgent things that end up on the list of to-dos. How many of you are list people? Like every time you're packing to go on vacation this summer, there's a list. Going to the grocery, there's a list, right? Even cleaning the toilet, there's step one, step two, step three, and your kids are punished if they don't do it that way or your husband, right? Um, the things that are urgent are the things that fill the list, the things we've got to get done today. And if we're honest, it's the things on the list when they get checked off that we feel the most accomplished about, which is really deceptive when you think about it because we're checking off the urgent things that we feel this need to get done, yet they don't actually move us towards the accomplishing or the arrival at the dreams or visions we have for the future. They're just another task often. They're just another something to do. You know, our days are often filled with these lists, whether they're, they're on pieces of paper with boxes for us to check printed from the computer in an Excel spreadsheet because we're OCD, or whether it's just a list we hold in our mind of got to do this, got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. And at the end of the day, we feel accomplished if we checked all those boxes. We feel discouraged if we didn't get them all checked, and we feel, you know, completely worthless if we didn't do any of them that we felt obligated to do that day, Right? And we allow that emotion to kind of carry us. And, and those are just the urgent things that really don't help long term in our lives. They're, they're just the maintenance items of life. Things like, you know, today I've got to remember tomorrow, I've got to drop the dog off at the groomer in the morning. And then uh, we've got to drop, I've got to drop off the dry cleaning too. And then I can go to work. Well, no, actually, I've got to stop and drop off the Red Box movie that we rented. So I've got to do that. And then I can go to work. And I've got to get there before the meeting. And I've got to reply to that email. And then I've got to finish that project I didn't get finished on Friday that kind of carried over because last week was a holiday week. And I'm already late on it. And I've got to get that finished. And then when work's out, I've got to go pick up the dry cleaning. And, and, and then I can head, well, no, and then I've got to get the dog. I can't leave the dog at the groomer. So I pick 
pick up the dog, and then I got to stop and pick up dinner because we're not going to have time to cook anything because I'm going to get out late tonight, and then I'll probably stop and rent another Redbox movie tonight because I'll be exhausted, but then first I get home, I got to mow the yard because it's going to rain the next seven days, and so I got to get that in, and then I can't forget it's America's Got Talent night, and I got to watch that, right? I mean, this is a simple yet practical list of things we have to accomplish on a regular basis. And yet none of them are truly important to moving the ball down the field to the dreams or visions we have for our lives. Meanwhile, the things that are most important never reach the urgent list until we see them breaking apart in front of us. See, normally what I see is the moment when people elevate the most important to become the most urgent. It's because there's a crisis or a collapse or a breakdown in relationships or finances or with the kids or in their health, or in a spiritual attack of some kind. It's only then when people are like, top of priority, i gotta, I got to spend more time with my kids because I didn't know this was going on behind the scenes. And I've been just kind of neglecting it, and I've been so busy. I need to invest more time in my marriage and my relationship because he came home, she came home, said, that's it, I think I'm done, I'm out of here. I didn't know it was getting that bad. I knew it was hard, I knew things were not good. I didn't know it was like that. I need to develop this friendship with somebody because I, I thought it was going good, but man, we just haven't spent time together, and then they said this, and, and that hurt, and I said this, and now we, it's just not good. I need to spend more intentional time as, as a disciple with God because I just feel like I'm just drifting further and further away. There's this wedge, there's this wall in my faith journey, and I've let other things get become a priority, and I've just kind of neglected what I know needs to be most important. That my spiritual life applies to every area of life. Sometimes you reach that point where you're just like, I, I, don't, I don't know what the list is. There's just one thing. I just got to pray because I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I mean, these are the things that are most important. But often they get pushed to the back of the line because we're so stinking busy. And we neglect what's most important to accomplish what's most urgent. The point here is focus. We don't have focus. We don't have goals. We're not driven by something bigger than we are. We're allowing small things to drive us day to day. We're not intentional. We're not proactive. We're reaction. Reactional. We're impulsive. One of the steps we've taken as a church this year is we've set aside a goal of a significant percentage of resources to a degree in which we never have before. Because we don't want this idea of multiplication, seeing another congregation birthed out of fusion, whether that's a church plant or a campus. Whatever that looks like is fine. We, we don't know what God has. We just know we need to move in that direction of multiplication. And so we've said, all right, God, this can be more than just words. This can be more than just ideas or dreams. But this is really going to be a vision, and we're going to tie to it next steps you want us to take. And so this year, with that goal, we are setting aside 5% uh, of, of total income in the life of our church that we won't use this year, but we'll set it aside and save it so we can multiply going forward because it's going to take significant financial resources in order for that to happen. Keeping the electricity on here, is, it's urgent. We, we want power and air conditioning this time of year. Keeping the internet service so the live stream can continue to happen and people can, can connect while they're on vacation or from around our area that can't get out. Keep, keeping toilets and floors clean for guests that arrive is an urgent need, but understand The church building is a tool for ministry. It's not the essence of who we are. These are urgent needs for a church. They're not important. We know that because in 2012, we spent an entire 16 months on the road using rented facilities. The shell of the building is not important. It's urgent. It's not important. We're not going to allow the vision of our church to be dictated by a facility. We're going to use a facility as a tool for ministry. And so this year we looked at our projected budget and we already decided 5% of whatever that total looks like is going to be set aside. That's going to be our goal this year to reach our next step. So we can demonstrate with faith to God we're taking steps in that direction, believing, Lord, that you're going to open doors in your timing as we begin to take steps of faith to demonstrate how serious we are about this calling you've placed upon our upon our lives, upon our hearts, upon our role as leaders. And so this year, that's over $30,000 that we want to set aside that is just a drop in the bucket of what will be required in order to take this step down the road. To use a parallel from Scripture, uh, I I, I think of um, Noah building the ark long before the rain ever came. 
the resources were there. He began to put his work, to, to, he began to put himself to work with his sons. He began to build the ark long before the rain ever came because the whisper of God gave him that indication. And that's kind of where I feel like we're at. Okay, God, we're going to start, we're going to start stockpiling resources to build the temple, even though we don't know when the temple's going to get built. We're going to stockpile resources to build the ark, even though we don't know when the rain's going to come. But that way, when the day comes and God begins to open up the floodgates and the rain starts to pour and we know that that we know that we know that he's saying it's time to move. It's time to go. We've got a boat to climb into to begin to take that, that voyage. See, chasing a vision intentionally requires you figure out what are the steps that are going to be needed to get there. And this applies in your faith journey as well. Personally, it applies at work and with your family and even at how you look at your retirement or the twilight years of your life. So God-honoring goals bring hope. God-honoring goals stretch our faith. God-honoring goals help us to focus they create focus on what we need to say yes to and what we say no to. And they also help us distinguish what we feel is important versus what is urgent and allow us to put priority on the important things and proper emphasis on the urgent stuff. As Wayne Cordero drew in the beginning of the video, I think it's true that oftentimes the stuff that fills our bucket is the important stuff. And often the, the stuff that drains our bucket is the urgent stuff that we have to do, that we have to deal with. But I think when we look at it that way, it's no wonder so many people are living empty lives because there's not enough of the important stuff that God designed us for being poured into our lives. Some people have convinced themselves of destructive ideas. Maybe you're one of them. Wayne alluded to them. Well, you don't understand. I'm just too, dis too busy in this season to have a date night with my spouse. No, you're too busy not to. I'm too busy to serve at church or participate in church regularly. You have no idea what my schedule is. No, if you have that much going on in your life, you must be grounded in, in what God says about who you are and what defines you. And you, you can't miss keeping your spirit, mind, and heart grounded in God's word and in the context of community. Well, you know, I'm just too busy to sit down and set goals for the future. I'm just running all over the place. Then you'll never reach the future you envision for yourself. And chances are you'll be running on empty so much that you'll destroy everything that you thought would be there with you in those dreams or visions for the future. As I close today, I want to end with a very practical challenge. I simply want to challenge you where you are to ask God, God, would you identify for me the one area that's most important for me to address over the next few months of my life? I want you to look back over the last year of your life, you know, the last 10 or 12 months, and I want you to say, what's an area that I've been struggling in? What area have you been neglecting or been avoiding or or maybe something you've just been annoyed by in life and it's time to stop putting off what you know God is telling you it needs. It needs your time, your energy, your attention, your faith, your focus, and it needs His power. I want to share with you just a few things that might spark a whisper from God that says, you know what, this is it. This is the exit ramp you need to take in this season of life and you need to do it now. Stop putting it off. You've been, you've been thinking about it for a long time. God's been convicting you of it for a while now. And one of the contextual things you need to understand is that in these lists of things that are just a starting point, it's not an exhaustive list, you cannot do them alone. You cannot leave this place and say, yep, I'm going to work on that and just keep it between you and God. Nothing will change. Nothing will change. That's why God created his community known as the church for us to, 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 to be utilized for each other's benefit, to take steps of faith together and with accountability. So the first one, do you need to invest in your life as a disciple of Jesus? that you need to, you have a spiritual journey need, that you've been coasting, you've been drifting, and you know you need to put some attention, energy in that area because you feel this gap or this wedge in your walk with God. And, 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 and you don't like it, but you don't know how to resolve it, but you know that you know that you know that it's there. Second thing, is your marriage stronger now than it was 10 or 12 months ago, or is it weaker? Do you have a marriage need? Is this the one thing that needs your attention and energy right now? It needs to jump to the top of the urgent list third thing, maybe you're not married but you're dating is your relationship stronger now than it was a year ago, you may say well the relationship didn't exist a year ago, okay is the relationship getting stronger is the relationship God honoring, is it growing in that way or is it actually dishonoring to God, are you living a life with proper boundaries, I mean we could ask these same questions to those who are married is there a marriage need because you're actually making compromises that, that you're hiding from your spouse are, are you living with boundaries that God has ordained? If you're not obedient to God, you won't receive his favor and blessing. And I would think we would say in the most intimate relationships in our lives, we want the favor and blessing of God. 
but it's tied to a desire and, and, a, and an application of obedience. So have you set up those boundaries or have you compromised? Do you need to start doing what you should do, as Paul says, not what your body wants to? And who's going to help you on that journey because you can't make that on your own? Fourth thing, are you a better dad or a better mom than you were 10 or 12 years ago? Do you regularly spend time with your kids one-on-one, investing in them, having conversations about your faith, living your faith out loud in front of them, or is that not thought not even entered your mind and you're just hoping they turn out good? Are your kids being raised in front of a screen or raised in FaceTime with their parents being invested in? What's dictating morals and ethics to your kid? Is it YouTube or entertainment or social media? Now, I want to challenge you. If you're wrestling with any one of these four things, like you're like, I think that might be it, or you're like, I know that's it. I want to encourage you, on the back of your communication card, there's a box that says, I'm interested in disciple maker groups. These are groups of three to six people, three to six people that are committing to get a little more intentional in life and walk through life together. So you have a place to share your struggles, share what's going on, what, what's really going on, not put on a mask, that, how you doing after church, you're out at coffee, how you doing, I'm good, how are you? Meanwhile, everything's falling apart or you're going through an emotional crisis, or you're going through something that you don't even know your way out of, but you're just like, I'm fine, you keep the mask on. This is a more intentional step together towards a small group of people that that you trust, where disciples are making and growing disciples, one another, iron sharpening iron. Check that box on your communication card, say, you know what, I need to know a little bit more about this. Because I think, because these first four things, you need someone in your life to help for God to speak through and to use in your life. And God wants to use you and speak through you into their life as well. The fifth thing that I just mentioned is finances. It's one that, that just seems almost inescapable. There's financial struggles. A church our size, we know that there's people that are barely making it by. Are you more in debt than you were a year ago? Are you able to celebrate steps you've taken over this last year to honor God? to be obedient, to decrease your debt? Are you putting God first in this area of your life, knowing that that when you place your financial resources under the blessing of God, that it pours out abundant favor into your life? Well, I want to share with you that, that getting involved in a disciple maker group would be an immediate step to begin to have conversations about this, but I want you to know Financial Peace University, uh, taught by Dave Ramsey that's hosted here at the church, is coming in just a matter of weeks now. It's going to happen in September. Uh, You can sign up on the website this week to be a part of it. There's a cost involved because there's a curriculum and some resources that come with it, but it's an investment in your future to help climb out of that slavery or bondage to maybe a pattern that's always been present. So I want to invite you just real quick. I want to pray with you. Just, Just bow your head, close your eyes. And I invite you to just ask God, God, would you show me what is my next step? Don't just go through the motions. Sit here and then go about your day and your week. If God is compelling you to check a box or to communicate something on that card, or God is calling you to to, to walk across this room and pull someone aside and say, I need help because you trust that person and only that person in this room, that's okay. If you're joining us online, you'd say, hey, there's one of these areas in my life that is just a mess. Would you email us or comment with us? Right now on our live stream team, Ralph is communicating with people joining online. He's available to you. If you have a prayer request, you can share it with him. He wants to be available and accessible for God to minister to you through him. So let's pray. Lord God, I can't begin to imagine what might be running through the minds of people here. But what I do know is, Lord, that all of us have experienced a life at drift. A life wandering in darkness. And we know that your word And your son did not come so we could just settle for that kind of a life. You've come to give us life and to give it more abundantly. You've come to pour out your favor and blessing. You've come to give us the fruits of your spirit, love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You've come to reward us with fruits of obedience. That when we forgive and we show mercy and we love one another, God, that's what your church is about. That's who we are. And there is no law against those things. No limit on those things. God, would you give us great clarity and discernment in this moment? What is the next step we need to take? Would you help give us the courage, Lord, not to just keep thinking about it, pondering it, Would you give us the courage to actually do, not just listen and so deceive ourselves, but to actually do what you're telling us to do. We need your help, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen.